Good morning, brethren. Hope you have a good Sabbath today. Mine's starting out good. Having some 8 o'clock coffee. You know what I'm talking about 8 o'clock coffee? But I want to talk about something here that's very important to us as Christians. For those of us who are striving to live in a way that pleases God and Jesus Christ. And uh, it's making the best of our time. Uh, you know, because God expects us to make the time that we have every day to make it uh, positive, worthwhile. Uh, we live in a time that seems to be flying by real fast. Uh, and it seems that we have no time for simple pleasures. You know, family time or spending time in prayer with God, Bible study. You know, God speaks to us through His Word, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Those who wrote the books of the Bible, the Word tells us that scriptures was breathed by the Holy Spirit of God and those who wrote the Bible. And, it, you know, it seems like that uh, we don't have a lot of time to do stuff. Meditation, prayer, Bible study, meditating, fasting, and, you know, atonement's coming up, and fasting is very important. Uh, and we'll talk about that at a later date. But uh, there's four letters in the alphabet. Uh, and the word is called busy. And those letters are B, and it stands for brought. And the U stands for under. And the S stands for Satan's. And the Y stands for yoke. Brought under Satan's yoke. And that's what happens when we allow the things of this world to interfere with our taking our time to prayer and study the Word. Because that's how we overcome. And that's how we grow. This is in studying the Word. And through prayer, uh, we communicate to God the Father and Jesus Christ through prayer. That's us communicating with Him. God and Jesus Christ communicate with us through His Word, the Bible. His Word spoken to us today. So, as you can see from the spelling of the word busy, those words I just spoke, Satan is behind it. Uh, Satan can influence us even in making time to do what is very important. Time is very important for our spiritual development. Satan is a spirit being. He's all-powerful. And he influences people's way of thinking. Of... Uh, and he and the angels with him, a third of the angels, rebelled against God. And they are powerful spiritual beings. And they can influence people's minds, just like Satan can, those demons. And they can be very deceitful, like the world is today, has been very deceived. Uh, deceived by false doctrine false gospel, ministers and preachers teaching a false God, a false Christ. And uh, so, you know, it's, it, it's just like Paul says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities of powers. Powers of the air for control of our minds, uh, thinking in our emotions, etc. and stuff. 
So I'm going to talk about uh, time and the importance of how we make the best of it. And what God says about it. And what Jesus said, how we are to make the best of our time. Uh, Time Flies. And that's the title of a very funny book comedian Bill Cosby wrote when he turned 50. Uh, with nostalgia, he reflects on his bygone days of youthful vigor and the often comical realities of growing older. Uh, Bill Cosby's book illustrates how a sense of humor can help us cope. with the trials of life. 50 can be pretty nifty after all. I'm past 50 many years ago. <laughs> but I've been lucky. God has really blessed me. Okay, after finishing uh, Time Flies, I thought about what, now I personally haven't read all the but I thought about what Cosby did not say. He never expressed regret for time wasted. That's largely because he has lived a very go-oriented and productive life. One of life's saddest feelings, as you know, is major regret for bad things that have happened. Or for good things that didn't happen. And as Ben Franklin said, life's tragedy is that we get old too soon and wise too late. How most people wish that they could turn the clock back and redo a part of their life. I guess I have felt that way in the past. Redo a part of their lives. Uh, we have to realize the value of the time that we have. Uh, you know, the Bible emphasizes the brevity and the fragility of life. This is what King David wrote. You want to take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 39, 4 through 5. It says, Lord, make me to know my end and what is the measure of my days, that I may know how frail I am. Indeed, you have made my days as hand breath, and my age is as nothing before you. Certainly every man at his best state is but vapor. We all know what vapor is. <laughs> Moses indicated that the typical lifespan in their day was only 70 years. Of course, with medical technology that has advanced <clears throat> since then, people live nowadays up to their 90s or their 100s. Now, longevity runs on both sides of my family. On my mom's mom's side, 80, 90 years old. On my dad's side, 70s, 80s. Both my parents lived in their 70s. But I think we can do a lot of things in our own life to make that possible by not smoking and all other kind of stuff that contributes to the shortness of living. But anyway, uh, Moses indicated that the typical lifespan in his day was 70 years, with 80 being fairly common as well. And you can find that in Psalms 90, uh, 10. Uh, 
So with the brevity of life in mind, he made this request of God. He said, teach us to number our days aright that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Verse 12. And that's on the New International Version. Okay. We should all pray as David and Moses prayed uh, for God's help to understand the great value of our time. Because our time is limited. And I have to make the most of each day. Are godly people rewarded with longer lives? Uh, not necessarily. Under the old covenant, when the people obeyed God's commandments to the letter of the law, they were promised physical blessings, longevity, and uh, material stuff. Of uh, uh, it's true that people who avoid sinful and risky behavior naturally tend to live healthier and longer lives. Sometimes God rewards a righteous person with a long life, relatively speaking. Uh, Psalms 91, 16 and Ephesians 6, 1 through 3. You can read about that. But God often allows uh, good people to die young and evil people to live long. When the Bible promises long life to God's people, he's ultimately referring to eternal life as a spirit being in the kingdom of God in the future. Another advantage of, of making the best of our time is on this journey that we're on, from the time we repent, baptize, receive God's Spirit, we enter that binding covenant with God the Father and Jesus Christ. It's a journey. It's a conversion process that's taking place. And it seems that a lot of people waste an awful lot of time. That means each one is wasting a huge chunk of his or her life. And so, you know, how we use our time says a lot about our character and our priorities. Oh, I love that 8 o'clock coffee. You know, the Bible places heavy emphasis on seeking wisdom. It's better than silver and gold and choice rubies. Proverbs 4, 7, Solomon says, Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And a big part of wisdom is knowing the value of time, learning to make the best and the most of it. I know that I have been guilty of wasting time in the past. Uh, but I know that when I pray to God every morning and I study the Word, as it's called washing of the water by the Word, that's how you grow and overcome. And over, this, over time, on this journey that we're on, the more that we obey God's commandments, we apply His laws, the more we practice it, it becomes a way of life to us. Well, God is writing His laws on our heart and in our minds. It becomes a way of life to us. Therefore, thus, our character is changing to a character that pleases God. And the lack of wisdom in most young people and many immature older people is evidenced by their improper priorities. 
uh, not yet realizing what really matters. Uh, some people spend much of their lives in pursuit of trivia, in pursuit of material things, making a lot of money, self-indulgence. They're loitering their lives away. However, both the Bible and history offer many examples of great accomplishments by people who use their time well. The Ecclesiastes 3, 12 through 13, you don't have to turn there, you can if you want to, says life satisfaction and joy is derived largely from productive work. And then in Genesis 2.15, you can mark that down if you want to, one of God's first commands to Adam in the Garden of Eden was to tend and keep it. The Bible clearly teaches a strong work ethic. Of course, I know that some people are disabled can't work. But still, uh, there are times of the day when you should, you should pray every day and Bible study every day. Now, um, God doesn't want us to be workaholics. That's why there's a weekly Sabbath. That's why he created weekly Sabbath. We need balance as we budget our time. We need to, time to stop and smell the roses, per se. The, the proper amounts of sleep, exercise, good nutrition, time with family, and time worshiping God. It's the most important. Will help us to be more productive in the long run. Uh, to everything, there is a season, a time, for every purpose under heaven. Now you can turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 1 to read that. Or you can just write it in your notes if you want to. So, you know, God revealed the weekly schedule man is supposed to follow uh, in the fourth commandment. And I just got through mentioning that a few seconds ago. It says in Exodus 20, 9 through 10, Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. Let's talk about good time management. Which means using one's time efficiently, effectively, and productively is an issue of great importance in business and industry. Time is valuable. Time is money in business. Yet many people kill time. Wasting small fragments of time adds up to loss of revenue that is forever lost. Making the most of every minute is not a new idea. Uh, Rudyard Kipling's famous poem, If, which was published in 1910, ends with these lines. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds, worth of distance run. Yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And which is more, you'll be a man, my son. I like that poem. A, for example, a person will accomplish much more in life if he learns to put uh, in between times and wait times to effective use instead of just fuming or daydreaming. For example, when you know you might have to wait in line, say at the post office or at the barbershop, 
I would bring along something to read. Or another option would be silent prayer while you're waiting in line. That's a good way to use time. When you're doing something physical that doesn't require much concentration, you can be listening maybe to a recording, maybe uh, something educational or spiritual. Uh, you can find many books on time management. And I guess it comes from those authors' different perspective. Many great accomplishments have been achieved by people who were using their spare moments. Let's look at a biblical perspective on using our time. Uh, managing our time becomes highly important when we recognize that God has called us to a life of serving Him and serving each other. Jesus said in John 15, 8, we can turn there if you want to, John chapter 15, verse 8. Jesus said, by this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. So to produce fruit for God and others, to enjoy, we must be willingly to unselfishly sacrifice our time. Great love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. That's John 15, verse 13. So Jesus himself personified these words. Because Jesus served the brethren. He served others. Even those who were not in the church, who were not being called, he healed. Unselfishly. Uh, and he, he personified these words, not just in his final hours of supreme sacrifice, but throughout his earthly ministry, the 33 and a half years. His ministry was for three and a half years. Uh, he was constantly giving of his time to help and teach others. And that's what we should do. The more that we grow in the Word, Studying and overcoming. The more that we study, the washing of the water by the word, the more that we can rightly divide the word of truth. And we can uh, get into the, the meat of the word, come out of the milk, the training part of it. Because God expects us to grow and overcome. He expects us to grow too. In studying his words, we can help others and answer questions. And that's part of making uh, the best of our time. To the Christians of, you know, of, of, of his day, Paul emphasized the seriousness of redeeming the time. Making the most of your time and opportunities. Ephesians 5, 15 through 16. <coughs> Excuse me. says so be careful how you live not as fools but as those who are wise make the most of every opportunity for doing good in these evil days and in Colossians 4 5 through 6 you don't have to turn there you just write that down in your notes Paul similarly wrote uh, live wisely among those who are not Christians and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and effective so that you will have the right answer for everyone. Jesus was certainly on fire with zeal and urgency for doing God's work. He says, 
Jesus said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, because the night is coming when no one can work. John 9, verse 4. He also said, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And that's in John 4, verse 34. So today, Christ wants followers who have the same kind of zeal and urgency for doing his work as he did. Another good reason for making the best of our time is none of us know how long we will live. I mean, I'm in my 60s now, and you seem like not too long ago I was in my 40s, 30s, 20s. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember thinking back then when I was in my 20s, well, I wonder if I ever lived to be in my 60s. <laughs> and here I am. So no matter how young and healthy and beautiful you are, don't be overconfident about living a long time. For Ecclesiastes 9.12 says, for man does not know his time. And James warns us. He says in James 4, 13 through 15, you can turn there if you want to. James 4, 13 through 15. He says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor. We mentioned that earlier in the beginning. What David said. That appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we shall live or do this or do that. So I do that a lot. If the Lord wills that I go there tomorrow, I'll do it. James points out that declaring future actions without considering that we are not in ultimate control of what will happen is ignorance. And boasting. Verse 16. He is referring not so much to exact wording as to our need for a humble attitude. Therefore, when talking about future plans, you don't necessarily need to specifically add the words, if the Lord wills, or God willing. Instead, we can say, I plan or expect to do such and such. Realizing that God may cause or allow things to work out differently. As an example, Jesus told a parable about a cocky and covetous rich man who felt sure he had plenty of time to eat and drink and be merry, but he died that very night. You can find it in Luke 12, 15 through 20. Then Jesus said, so is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. That's verse 21. Another aspect to making the best of our time here, be ready and stay ready to meet your maker, spiritually speaking. Jesus repeatedly promised that one day he will suddenly return. Of course, the majority of the world is not going to be expected but those who have God's spirit, who's been called, who's been on the journey, who's been faithful, they know that, that Christ is going to return to earth to set up his kingdom. Matthew 24, 23 through 36. And he warned that when that day approaches, most people will be spiritually unprepared, like I just got through saying. 
except for those who have God's Holy Spirit. Those who, by the washing of the water by the word and through prayer, and growing and overcoming, make the best of their time. Excuse me. Like the people in the days of Noah, until the flood came and took them all away. They were unprepared too, the majority of the people. Just Noah and his family and the animals. <laughs> you see, so, so Jesus said, therefore, we should be ready. Spiritually, be prepared. And be knowledgeable of his word. For the Son of Man is coming an hour that you do not expect. Those who are spiritually ready will receive eternal life. Those who are not won't, like the women, like the like, like the women, the five virgins. I mean, the, uh, I'm sorry, like the virgins who didn't have enough oil. That's what I'm trying to say. Sometimes I get my tongue gets twisted. <laughs> so the need to stay spiritually prepared is illustrated. Uh, by the well-known parable of the ten virgins. That's what I was trying to talk about. Uh, picturing ten bridesmaids accompanying the bride on a night-time procession to meet the bridegroom. And that's Matthew 25, 1 through 13. Having an ample supply of lamp oil, which is a symbolic for a Holy Spirit, having the Spirit of God, uh, lamp oil represents being prepared. The bridegroom represents Jesus Christ uh, returning to marry his bride, the church. And the five foolish virgins, as I stated earlier, represent Christians who will be unprepared for Christ's return. Now, what if you? Now, what if we somehow knew the date when Christ will return? So let's consider. What difference would it make if you died before he returns? Well, we need to be spiritually prepared always. Because even if we die before his return, we can be rest assured that we will be resurrected in the first fruits of the resurrection. We're not to live in in anxiety or worry over such a possibility. Rather, we are to get our spiritual houses in order now. I put stuff, you know, on the group Churches of God discussion. I mean, Churches of God news all the time about spiritual preparedness. And the end for each person Christ's coming or the person's death, whichever comes first, Jesus warned that when a person thinks the end is far off, he tends to procrastinate and compromise, let down spiritually. You can read about that in Matthew 24, 48 through 51, also Luke chapter 21 and 34 through 36. Rest assured, God is on our side as long as we continue to be connected with God through prayer, through washing of the water by the word, growing and overcoming. All of that is an operation of the grace of God. He is on our side and he is pulling for us. He wants no one to perish, but desires all men to be saved. For all people to receive everlasting life. Just think about the joyous everlasting life to come. And God's realm as a spirit being. The majority of the world don't believe none of that. They consider what I've been talking about here. They consider that mainstream Protestantism, Catholicism, Hinduism, all that. They consider that nonsense. They don't believe none of it because they reject God. They reject Jesus Christ. They reject his truth. Uh, but no more shortage of time. 
No more running out of time. No worries about time. Time will no longer fly by too fast as a spirit being because spirit beings live forever. We'll have plenty of time. Time that goes on and on and on. In the meantime, time flies. So we should make the most of each and every day. So thank you for listening and for watching. And have a peaceful Sabbath today, my friend. Bye-bye.